Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. You know, I'm trying to remember exactly how we got connected. I think what happened is back when I kind of started following a high fat, low carb diet, I started looking at a lot of different stuff, including, um, I'm trying to remember what, what organization it was. It might've been Mark Sisson was mm-hmm. talking a lot about bone broth and kind of like all the ins and outs of what, like how, how, how awesome it is to kind of just, you know, use the whole animal, so to speak and make your own bone broth. So I started just making it myself, especially in the summer when it was hot and I was, my sweat rate was a lot higher. And, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I would take like a, a slow cooker and I'd throw in like, you know, scraps of, of bones and chicken carcasses and things like that and just slow cook it overnight and make my own. And, um, you guys were the first organ or the first, uh, I guess bone broth company that, that I got connected with that actually, uh, seemed to be doing it the same way I was, but making it quite a bit easier than waiting 12 hours and having the slow cooker run all day long. So, uh, I was sold pretty quickly. And I want to say Holly had maybe read a blog post I had written about making bone broth, or I had mentioned it on a podcast or something that she heard and she had contacted me through, through my website. And that's how I was first introduced to it. And, um, you guys have kind of taken off since then I live like, right across the street street from a sprout. So I do most of my grocery shopping there. So I started seeing you guys pop up there not too long after that. So it's been kind of, kind of cool just to see, see you guys show up in all these different spots. Yeah. It's been uh, it's been really weird. <laughs> uh, like we, we definitely had a, we definitely started this business and we we're kind of thinking it would be a small side thing and, and uh, just, you know, a, a thing that, you know, I started it with my brother um, mm-hmm. he was 19 years old and thought it would be kind of like a, a cool thing that I personally wanted to see in the world. Mm-hmm. And it's just gotten more of a response than, than anything I could have anticipated. It's been crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's always interesting to see those kind of like those ideas take off like that. I, I, I know another guy who lives just north of me up in Flagstaff named Ross Taylor. And you've maybe heard of uh, the F bomb company in the past. They yeah. make like these nut butter sachets essentially. And, and his is kind of the same thing where like he'd been following a, a keto diet for I think like 20 years. So he had been in it like before it was cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and he started thinking about like, just like the practical uses for stuff like that. And uh, he, he probably credits me more than he needs to, but he said he listened to a podcast I was on where I was talking about like how logistically hard it is to carry like, uh, macadamia nuts along on a run or something like that. And he said, yeah. that that's when he came up with the idea of making the macadamia nut, uh, uh, F bomb. So, um, yeah, they've gotten big too. Now they're, they're in like whole foods, sprouts, CVS and places like that. So it's, but he's, he's the kind of same way. I don't think he ever envisioned becoming, becoming, I guess, more mainstream than, than not. So it's, uh, a different world for sure. Yeah, completely. Um, what about you, man? What's your story? Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, I got into extreme endurance back in like 2010. I've been, been kind of a runner my whole life since middle school and started taking it kind of seriously in college and, uh, more or less realized that I enjoyed the longer stuff more than the shorter stuff. So I just kind of kept following that route and found myself eventually doing hundred mile races. Uh, I used to, I used to teach, uh, high school and middle school for a couple of years as well. But then in 2015, I moved out West to kind of focus more on training, racing, coaching, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Super cool. And how's the podcast going? Really good. It, it feels like we just started yesterday, but we've been doing it for about a year and a half now. And I, I want to say this is episode like 152, 151, something like that. So we've been kind of cranking them out. That's awesome. It's super cool. I, uh, 
I don't know. I've been, I've been very, uh, very heartened seeing how many good people are just like starting podcasts and seem to be getting really good reception. Just it's, it's something that's honestly, I've, I've thought about once or twice. I don't know if I'll actually do it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but at least not right now, but it just seems like such an incredible way to, to get, you know, build an audience and, and relatively like enjoyable too. Yeah. You know, I've always liked the long form stuff better than the typical social media. And I've, I've been going on podcasts since I kind of started ultra running. And a couple of years ago, I kind of the same thing that you just mentioned. I was always curious about kind of doing one from this end of it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to talk Sean into <laughs> helping out. So <laughs> we've teamed up and been able to do it for a bit now. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. I think uh, just, just being able to talk to people that you maybe otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to do a deep dive into a topic with is pretty cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's super cool. Sean, can you hear us? All right. I can hear you guys. It's fine. Justin, thanks. Welcome for coming. Um, let's, let's Justin, I, I, I kind of came in two or three minutes late, so I'm not sure if we want to, do we get over your background yet? Did we kind of go into that yet, Zach? Or, or not? No, we've just been kind of chit chatting. So we okay. can, we can yeah. officially fire things off with Justin kind of giving us an intro. Yeah, so you kinda... hi, Justin. Th again, thanks for coming on. I know you, you, you're the guy at Kettle and Fire and, and the Bone Bra stuff, but tell us a little bit about kind of who you are, if you don't mind. So my quick, quick thing on my background, uh, you know, I, about five years ago now, I was working in tech, living in San Francisco, um, had just come out of a, a tech startup that was selling software to software developers and uh, effectively was being, I was constantly around people that were not prioritizing their health. Like the, the kind of de facto culture in tech is a lot of pizza, a lot of beer, a lot of like hunching over a computer screen and, and being super immobile. Um, and, and I think I like fell into that a little bit. And so uh, when I came out, I'd been, you know, I started going paleo in 2011 uh, and decided that, you know, rather than sell software to software developers, I wanted to, to do something that I was passionate about and that actually excited me. And so I uh, basically took a year, was looking at a bunch of different things I could do in health and wellness. And the one thing that just I kept coming back to is uh, I was traveling a lot. Bone broth was something I was trying to incorporate into my diet had a bunch of friends in CrossFit and an amateur MMA fighter uh, that were like, hey, you know, a bunch of people we know are using bone broth and yet there's not really a good source. Uh, I tried making it on my own. It came out horrendously, like literally undrinkable. Uh, and so decided to team up with my brother and launched the, the first bone broth brand that was made with super high quality ingredients, um, you know, 100 per, uh, bones from 100% grass fed cattle, organically raised chickens. Uh, and honestly, what we thought would be a side business, here we are three and a half years later uh, with, with a real business, 30 employees, and just, it's been a, it's been a wild ride for sure. That's, that's awesome. And I think, uh, you know, when I think of bone broth, I kind of think of like the homemade stuff that I used to, used to do in the slow cooker, like we were kind of chatting about before we got started here. And um, when I, when I first kind of looked at like a kettle and fire and kind of their process, I was impressed with kind of how close it is to like the way that I would do it at home if I were to make it myself, which isn't the case. I think with a lot of bone broths, a lot of bone broths, I think that, you know, they're, they're going to try to accelerate the process, so to speak, in order to get more product out there at a cheaper rate. Whereas you guys seemingly are doing what I was doing at just a mass scale. Am I more yeah. or less on point with that? Do you guys essentially have massive slow cookers that you're <laughs> churning out bone broth in? Yeah, we have, huge 2000 gallon steel drums that are like 40 feet high that are just churning and, you know, cooking, uh, cooking all of our bone broth. It's, it's pretty wild actually. It's a, it's a crazy operation. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the first thing I thought about when I heard that too, was, uh, when I used to live in Wisconsin, you know, they're big into breweries and things there. So you could always tour like the big brewery plat places and they'd have these massive like brewery things and you could actually like taste test it and stuff. So I, I just envisioned like in the future, people touring the kettle and fire plants and taking yeah. a spigot of bone broth fresh out of the. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I would love that. We do that as a team, but, uh, but the general public has not been allowed to experience that just yet. <laughs> Though I'd love to. Cool. Yeah. 
So how did you kind of get into the thought process of bone broth specifically? Did you, were you, did you like do some research into kind of like where the, the tradition was with that and then kind of go from there? How did you first be familiar, come, become familiar with it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I, I definitely have a, have bought into the like ancestral paleo kind of mindset as far as health and wellness goes. And, you know, getting into that, I, I was kind of just doing a, a review and looking at, you know, what, what nutrients does the body need to thrive? And am I getting those from, from my diet? And, you know, looking at my diet and talking with a, a nutritionist, a functional nutritionist at the time, uh, we kind of identified that my, my diet, even though I was eating paleo, even though I was eating like all organic relatively well, uh, I was eating a lot of vegetables, some nuts, uh, a lot of, you know, muscle meat. But what I was kind of lacking on was any sort of organ meat or a lot of the collagen and amino acids that come from basically organ meat and bone broth. And so uh, what, what she recommended is that I start incorporating bone broth into my diet. And kind of as I got further and further down the path of understanding and researching what are the benefits of incorporating these amino acids, the collagen and everything into your diet, uh, the more I was like, wow, this is a, a, a crazy important set of nutrients to incorporate into your diet from a gut, joint, skin health standpoint that a lot of people are just missing. And so that's kind of when I, I read more about it, read more about the, the use of glycine, it's really, you know, how it helps with sleep, how it helps with gut function, uh, read more about collagen, which makes up you know, nearly 60% of the, the overall protein content in your body uh, and just started getting more into this and was like, man, this is something that, that I think is really important for me to incorporate into my diet. And something that your average American or even your average like paleo person is often not getting enough of. And so that, that's kind of what started me down the path of looking at, you know, what, what do I want to incorporate into my diet to achieve what I consider, you know, optimum or close to optimum health. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, when I think of organizations that kind of more or less spearheaded, the uh, kind of the popularity of bone broth, I think of like the Weston A. Price Foundation. And then uh, I know like what I said before, Mark Sisson was pretty vocal about that stuff kind of in, at least during the years when I was first introduced to it. I'm sure there were other folks out there kind of before that, that were kind of banging that drum, maybe not to as big of an audience as they have today. Totally. What, what I mean, just let me ask you some questions about you know some of the science behind I mean because much of the much of the well we hear a lot about collagen supplementation of collagen and some of the collagen peptides that are popular and, and, and certainly some of those would be in bone broth um, what are the sort of the supposed benefits of bone broth and, you know and what what supports that with regard to collagen and maybe any other sort of properties that maybe most people aren't aware of about collagen is there anything else beyond the collagen content that we would, we would get a benefit from. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think one of the interesting things about uh, bone broth specifically is that there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of a uh, full other amino acids in bone broth that you're not getting in other parts of your diet. So people are pretty, pretty like understanding of the benefits of collagen just in general. Um, you know, but I think that a lot of people don't necessarily understand uh, the benefits of, of bone broth, not only in, in, from the standpoint of like how useful it is from an electrolyte uh, standpoint, which can help with people transitioning in, in or out of keto, uh, but also some of the other, other different amino acids, uh, you know, glycine, gelatin are, are two that kind of come to mind that help a lot with the, you know, making sure that the lining of your gut is super strong and, and high integrity. Uh, these amino acids can also help with regulating your, your kind of sleep and hormones and, and they're things that frankly people just don't get in many parts of their diets in general uh, and so that's kind of the those are kind of the, the some of the things that i think people maybe underappreciate as, as far as when they think about bone broth you know collagen is certainly part of that story but it's not all of it i mean I, i'd actually be interested sean to hear your thoughts too being um you know being someone who incorporates a lot of organ meat in your diet like where do you see bone broth kind of fitting in relative to um, what you're getting from other organ meats or, or bone marrow or something like that? Well, I mean, to be honest, I, I'm not somebody that incorporates a lot of organ meats. I rarely eat them, if ever. I mean, my diet is mostly muscle meat, so just to be honest. And so 
Um, but I do think that uh, for many people, uh, and, and again, not, you know, I'm on a crazy carnivore diet. And so my diet is obviously not the American standard diet. And so I think that in general, our diet is depleted of nutrition. You know, just in general, if we look at the standard diet where most of it's processed food and empty calories. And so I think incorporating uh, organ meats, bone broth, bone marrow, you know, those types of things are going to have a much larger impact in that situation than it would be for someone perhaps in my situation, I think. So that, that's my take on that. Um, you know, I, I have kind of, uh, it's kind of funny because I'm, I'm not someone who, I never really like coffee, I never liked hot drinks. Uh, when I have, and I've had you guys' this product, and, I, and I'll, I'll drink it in the wintertime when it's cold because that's, that's when I don't mind drinking a hot drink. But, I mean, that's, that's, that's how I've kind of done this. Um, when I look at a steak, I know it's going to be 3% collagen by volume. So, I mean, and I'm eating four steaks a day. So, I'm eating more collagen than the average American is by far because most Americans eat none, right? I mean, most wow. Americans eat almost nothing. So, yeah. my volume of that's going to be much higher. Um, you know, I'm still, just to be honest, I'm still open-minded enough to say I don't know the answer yet because I'm, I'm seeing too many uh, – uh, you know, too much variation in, in results that people are having to just be able to make a proclamation on what everybody what needs to do. And again, that this is this is diet context dependent. I would say that the average American and probably the average person that's listening to this podcast probably would benefit from including more nutrient dense food in their diet. And I think bone broth certainly does fit that bill uh, for many people. So that's that's kind of my perspective on that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean. Um, I think you and I are probably aligned on, you know, the average person is not eating, not getting any sort of collagen or amino acid, like you said, in their diet. And so, you know, they're eating a lot of nutrient light foods, especially highly processed carbohydrates and the like, um, you know, and, and when you do that, especially over consistently over a long period of time, uh, I think it really harms your body's ability to function and, you know, achieve your athletic or even just day-to-day -day health and wellness goals. It's, it's kind of crazy to me that, uh, you know, just the, the state of the average American diet today is, is shameful. Well, and another thing I, that I think is interesting that you mentioned, Justin, is kind of like how bone broth can play into kind of the health of your gut lining. And I was trying to remember, Sean, and maybe you can remember if uh, when we had on uh, Sabatooth and uh, Jofia Clemens from the Paleo Medicina group, and Justin, if you're not familiar with them, they essentially work with folks who have like really, really compromised digestion and they put them, put them on like a keto carnivore style diet where it's based primarily out of animal products, if not entirely at like a ratio of around 80 to 82% fat and the remaining being protein. And I'm trying to remember if they mentioned anything about using bone broth for that process with the, with the, the intestinal lining or anything like that. Because it seemed like it would fit within their framework if they're making the broth out of just you know, bones and scraps from the, the leftovers of whatever animal they had been eating. Yeah, I mean, Zach, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head if they did or not. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of it was in you know, Hungarian translation, so it was a little tough to get. I mean, certainly I've seen a lot of people out there, you know, anecdotally saying that it does seem to help with, with gut function. I don't, I don't, Justin, you may have even had more information yeah. on that than I do. And, and I don't know if there's, like I said, the, the, the problem becomes, you know, do we have any kind of, you know, scientific data to, to sort of support our anecdotal claims and believe me i'm aware of that uh because much of what i've seen is anecdotal and what i what i what i've sort of responded to and so what are you aware of any you know science on gut health that, that would indicate that you know some component of bone broth may be beneficial yeah so there's um so i'm i can definitely send you a bunch of stuff but basically there's and chris Kresser actually has a pretty good article on um on the benefits of of bone broth but you know, one of the things that is interesting uh, is that gelatin, you know, helps like helps make up and maintain the layer of mucus that kind of keeps the, the lining uh, that keeps like gut microbiomes away from the intestinal barrier. And so there's been actually a given a, a mouse model study that showed that gelatin supplementation, which, you know, gelatin is an amino acid found uh, prominently in bone broth. Like really reduce the severity of colitis 
uh, that they found in, in a bunch of mice in this experiment, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. It's, it's also, you know, gelatin and glycine combined, uh, there've been a couple studies that have also shown how they reduce the inflammation, uh, specifically in the gut, uh, that in, in, in these different studies, which, uh, Again, you know, mouse models doesn't replicate perfectly to humans, but but I think it's it's pretty interesting uh, in general and points to the fact that bone broth uh, and the amino acids in bone broth specifically help maintain the integrity of the the, the mucus in the the gut lining that kind of separate you know and reduce intestinal permeability. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to butcherbox.com and place your first order. Now back to the show. You know, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's something what, you know, like I said, we've seen a lot of interest in, in gut permeability recently. And so I think that goes along with what we're seeing. What, uh, you know, how, how has your product evolved over the, because you said you've been in business for several years. How's the product evolved over the last few years? What kind of <laughs> things have you kind of figured out as you've gone along? It'd be interesting to see how that went. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, I mean, we've, we've certainly had, uh, had challenges and, and things, um, challenges as we've scaled the business. Like we started out, you know, it was two man team, uh, buying bones from a couple of grass fed ranchers, uh, in the country as we've scaled, you know, we've become one of the largest purchasers of grass fed bones in the country right now. And so our supply chain has been really challenging to keep up with. Like we've had to talk to hundreds of different ranches that, are 100% grass fed, grass finished, uh, make sure that they use proper, you know, proper uh, growing and ranching practices, all kinds of things. And that, and then working with, with that many different groups has been, been a challenge, but from a product standpoint, we really candidly didn't, uh, didn't really know what we were doing when we got into the business. Like we were talking a little earlier about, you know, Zach and I about um, kind of like the massive 40 or 50, uh, 50 foot, steel tanks that we brew and make our bone broth in that is a totally different process than the one where you're like making it in a slow cooker at home and so you get a lot of different problems uh, that that crop up just making bone broth at a scale like that as opposed to on kind of smaller scale equipment and so one of the things that we realized early on is like if you're making it in a crock pocket pot at home you know you can just throw in the bones kind of let it sit and then we you know it's it's done in 24 to 48 hours for us, we, we tried to do that for some of our earlier production runs, and we found that all of the bones would sink to the bottom, which doesn't really matter when you're in a crock pot, but if you're using a 40 to 50 foot steel tank, like it meant that the product at the very top of this tank wouldn't get like enough exposure to the bones, and so we'd get sort of like this crazy rich bone broth, and then it would get slowly more watery as it went towards the top of the tank. And so, um, you know, one we've just done a ton of weird things like figuring out how to paddle, um, paddle mix and stir the, uh, the, the bones and, and everything happening in the tank. Um, we've also done a lot of testing to figure out, you know, what bones are, are the most nutrient rich, what bones have the, the most amount of collagen. So we've, we've tested a, a, a bunch of different bone mixes to say, okay, you know, if we put in 20% patella, 80% neck, for example, like what is that? lead to from a bone broth standpoint and from a collagen and amino acid standpoint relative to a different mix. What happens if we include tendons or chicken feet or all of these kinds of things. And so the product has slowly evolved and gotten a lot better um, and also gotten much more nutrient dense than we, since we started about three and a half years ago. Uh, but it's certainly been a, a lot of failures and a lot of learnings on the way for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I would guess, you know, just looking what I know about human bones is that, you know, if we look at like the patella has the, the thickest cartilage in the body. And so I assume that's easier to, to, to sort of liberate the, the, the type one collagen from, or sorry, the, the, the hyaline car, 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 cartilage from uh, that stuff rather than the, the type one that's in bones, which is, you know, you know, sort of wrapped in this mineral matrix. And so that would be kind of interesting. So you find that patellas and maybe you know, ends of femurs and stuff like that are, or where, where you go for your, for your best bone, yeah, my so guess? We basically focus on a patella, femur, and then a lot of like joint bones. And so right, we'll sure. back, uh, knuckle, stuff like that. How long does it take? I mean, what's the process? I mean, what is, I mean, for you guys are the commercial process, is this a couple of days? Is it a few, you know, oh, yeah. 24 hours or what's, what's, the, what's the time frame? Yeah, it's, it's a couple of days. I mean, so we cook all of our, uh, all of our beef bone broth for, uh, you know, north of 24 hours. Uh, man, the, the plant when we're doing our cooks does not smell ideal. I can tell you that, but we, uh, you know, we, we source the bones from all these ranches. We put them in these, these big steel drums. Uh, we set up the paddling equipment. We add some of the the few herb spices, uh, some salt, and then we do like a cook for about 24 hours. And then, kind of coming out of that, uh, we package it into our into our current packaging, which is shelf stable with no additives or preservatives. Um, and, and we do that because like we heat the broth, and then while it's still hot, we fill the the product uh, and then run it through something called a retort process, where it's basically enclosed in this box and then exposed to enough heat where where the USDA considers it kind of safe to, to ship and consume. Um, but we, we spent a ton of time perfecting and working on this process. Uh, and you, actually, when we launched, we're like the first, first company to use this, this sort of packaging technology in the bone broth world. Does, does the USDA have to be involved in inspecting the process? Is that part of the deal, I would imagine? Yeah, they, they do. I mean, you know, fortunately or, or unfortunately, uh, but they, because it's a meat product, uh, they have to be involved in, in the inspection and approval of, you know, our ingredient panel, our ingredient list, our, our nutrition facts panel, uh, the final product going out the door, all that kind of stuff. Where's your, where's your facility located? Or do you have more than one? I mean, where's your main facility? Yeah. So we, we have a couple, um, all in the Midwest, um, one in, okay. in Wisconsin actually too. So Zach, if you want to make your bone broth t- craft dreams become a reality, we can play. <laughs> <laughs> you guys gonna make me go back and deal with winters in the Midwest again? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll plan a summertime trip. There you go. All right, uh, you can sell me on that in Phoenix. I'll definitely go to the Midwest in the summer. So, <laughs> um, you know, another interesting kind of topic along these lines that that maybe you have some insight into, Justin, would be you know just the food system in general. Because when I think of bone broth, I think of it as like this kind of great process to go full circle and utilize the entire the entire animal or the entire like food uh that is available to you rather than taking the, the more, more desirable pieces so to speak and then just throwing away the rest and when i look at our kind of food systems here in the united states i mean you can find stats that show that we're wasting upwards of 40 percent of finished products and, you know, when you have things like that, you know, that's kind of scary that, you know, we're wasting that much food or that our food system is, is, is that inefficient in terms of, you know, of waste, I guess. Um, so for like your process, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of see it as like this, uh, this conversation taking place where like you go to some of these local, local butchers or whomever you're getting the bones from and saying, you know, we would actually like to use that product. Did you find that these folks were like, oh, great, we were just going to throw those away anyway? Or is there other things that are these bones are being used for on top of that as well? No, I mean, when, when we started the business, most of these bones were getting thrown away. And so, you know, we would talk to a rancher, talk to a, a, a meat processor, and they basically looked at the bones and said, you know, like, what are we going to do with these? No one, no one in, the, in the meat processing world knows how to or even wants to start a food brand and so they were just throwing them up oftentimes they would grind up the bones use them as fertilizer or just throw them out and put them in a landfill i mean i think it's one of the one of the really unfortunate parts of the food system as it currently works is there is a lot of waste at many different points and you know one of the things that that's so exciting to me about what we're doing is just that i see kettle and fire as one small way that we can kind of 
fight back and make a change um, and, and make the food system slightly more sustainable. Like we're taking parts from an animal that traditionally just end up in a landfill, get ground up and thrown away uh, and, and turning it into a source of real nutrition for people. Now, when that was true, like when we, when we started, you know, since then, as bone broth has become a bit more of a thing, uh, we've actually seen like from day one of the company, people would be excited for us to take the bones off their hands. Now there's a bit more of a market for buying bones, which is, uh, you know, which is kind of interesting. But you yeah. created an economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And I'm, I'm always uh, impressed with a couple companies in the food system that I think are doing things right. Like another company I, I admire in a lot of ways, um, even though they're somewhat of a competitor is, I think Epic with all of the stuff they're doing around nose tail and, you know, bringing organ meat into many of their products, uh, I, th I think are really impressive. And I think that there's becoming more and more of an appetite for companies and brands that are trying to trim the waste out of the food system. And I, I think, I don't think we'll get there entirely, but I'm really excited and, and like proud of the work that we're doing to kind of do our part with that. Yeah. You know, we've had a lot of kind of, regenerative agriculture folks on the show, including Alan Savory, uh, Joel Salatin, and most recently Bobby Gill, who's involved with the Savory Institute. And they've mentioned Epic being a company that uh, is kind of quote unquote approved as like doing it their way or the way that they consider to be uh, the most sustain sustainable method available to us at the time. Um, which brings up another topic that we've kind of talked about that, again, maybe you have some insight into this and um, I, I run a bit of a risk by bringing any type of a political topic to the conversation, but you know, one thing that's kind of uh, more in the the mainstream, I guess, talking now is just regulations around small farms and kind of the process they have to go through in order to get their product to market. And they're oftentimes getting squeezed by some of these bigger companies like the Cargills and the Tysons of the world. And there's there's talk of like legislation that would kind of relax that a bit and uh is that something that would be beneficial for a company like kettle and fire where you're actively trying to find high quality bones would it make it easier for you to acquire those if these small family farms are given more of an opportunity to go direct to market and, and not work through some of these major conglomerates yeah I, I think that uh i think like a lot of things there's there's trade-offs i think that it's it's pretty easy to look at some of these complex issues and, and say like, oh, this is clearly a dumb thing. Sometimes, sometimes that's true. I mean, it's the government. There's a lot of dumb things that happen. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but, you know, I think in this case, on the one hand, yeah, I think it's phenomenal and, and totally in support of farmers uh, moving more towards you know, being able to go direct to market. I think that I'm very, very bullish in all four uh, more and more kind of localized supply chains, especially from a, a farming standpoint, especially when you look at like the rate of nutrient degradation between, you know, that happens when you pluck a vegetable in California and ship it to New York to be sold. It's like, I, I think localized supply chains make all the sense in the world that are better for the environment, better for farmers, better for, you know, local community health. Um, that said though, there, I'm not sure that uh, if if those sort of regulations were were lifted, that there would that it would really improve things f as far as a company like our ability to work with a bunch of these small farmers. Like one of the things that standardization does do that's really helpful is if something is organic, you know, a farmer has had to go through a ton of effort, energy, and expense uh, to get something certified organic. But us as a company, we can go okay. We we know that they've hit a certain standard that's been verified by an outside party and like it makes us comfortable sourcing from them. If some of these regulations and stuff are repealed on the local level, uh, unfortunately there's just a lot of cheats and people that will, will say like, Oh yeah, we do regenerative or we're hundred percent grass fed grass finished. Uh, I think as long as the, the economic incentive for some of these local farmers is to say you're grass fed, but not incur that expense, you know, it's, it's going to be hard for a company like mine who, cares a lot about sourcing standards to totally trust, you know, a thousand different small farmers uh, that they're doing exactly what they say. Like we just, we just don't have the manpower to check each and every one. And so I think what, what could happen is um, that regulation could lead to uh, 
companies like ours actually trying to work more with the big guys that can meet our supply chain needs uh, and also have the certification that, that you know, we're kind of looking for. Well, I mean, just, I mean, just thinking from a financial standpoint as a company, I mean, the, the bigger guys are, are probably going to be able to offer you a better rate anyway. I mean, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be fair to say? Uh, perhaps. I mean, a lot of it depends. Like a lot of, if you look at a, a lot of food supply chains, a lot of the cost of supply is actually tied up in transportation. Uh, like I've seen, uh, you know, if you're growing an orange in California, um, effectively, I think it's like 60 or 65% of the cost of the orange when it ends up on shelf is some combination of logistics uh, and logistics and transportation and storage. And so I think that if you're a huge you know, company with a facility in, in uh, Chicago, it is actually possible, in my opinion, that, that you could be outcompeted in the New York market by a farmer that was closer you know, to New York. Now, if that applies to something like bone broth, I'm more skeptical, but I think for certain categories, uh, that, that actually could apply. But yeah, in our case, like, you know, we're buying more grass-fed bones than, than almost anyone in the country, uh, possibly more than anyone in, in the country, that I'm, as far as I'm aware. And that just means that we have to buy in huge quantities, which also means that there's only so many people we can work with that can actually meet our supply needs. How much, how many bones do you go through a year? What's the volume? I mean, I don't even, I guess you would do it in pounds, I suppose. Or yeah, what so would be? We, we go through, uh, right now, it's looking like about three to four million uh, pounds of bones. And what does that yield as far as product? I mean, what do you get like if you, 50 pounds of bones equals how much bone broth or whatever? Yeah, I'm so it, it depends on the product that, that we're making. Um, but kind of, we look at one pound of bones roughly, uh, per like 16.2, uh, ounce container of bone broth. Okay. So you're, so you got like 3 million of those. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What is the difference between, cause I know you have different, you guys have different variations. You've got beef bone broth and you've got chicken and a few others in there. What, what is, is there any quantitative or qualitative differences between the, between the two different, uh, or three different types that you have? Yeah, so you know the difference we have um, we we have a couple different types. We just launched a, a line of uh, our seasoned bone broths. So we have like chipotle beef, uh, which is amazing, um, turmeric ginger chicken, like some of these, which are more for sipping uh, broths. But the core difference is kind of between beef and chicken. Uh, some you know beef tends to have um, slightly different amino acid profile, a uh, little bit more collagen, uh, often a little bit less, just like. Nu nutrition facts uh, label protein and uh, chicken tends to be higher protein but um, you know often doesn't uh, doesn't gel because it just has slightly slightly small you know fewer slightly less collagen and gelatin in it um, so there's basically a different amino acid profile between the two and a lot of that is driven just by the different bones that you're using like if you're using uh, femur bones in a beef bone broth you're going to get a lot more of the bone marrow um, you know, a lot more of like really rich connective tissue that's coming from the neck and the patella and the, and the, uh, the kind of like toe knuckle joints. Uh, whereas from a chicken standpoint, like there's just not as much connective tissue cartilage uh, that is on those bones because they're much smaller animals. And so as a result, um, you just get a slightly different amino acid profile that's much more concentrated in, um, or, or much less concentrated in a lot of like the, the connective tissue breakdown, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's interesting. I mean, I kind of suspect that there'd be something something similar to that. What do you guys do with the bones when you're done? I mean, is it something you guys are some use for bones after they've been de, you know, collagened, I guess? Or yeah, <laughs> I mean, I mean, are they still available for bone meal or what? What do you got? I mean, because you got three million pounds of bones, how do you dispose of those? Yeah, so you know, they're they're kind of like flexible. They've been uh, they've been cooked down quite a lot, uh, and so what we do right now is we we. Uh, grind them up and, and they're used as bone meal. Exactly. That's the most common thing. Uh, occasionally that makes its way into um, organic fertilizers uh, and stuff like that, which, which is um, pretty helpful. And so we've, we've worked also hard on figuring out, you know, what's a good supply chain for the bones after we're done cooking. Them. And, and that tends to be uh, the most popular usage. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because people don't realize, you know, we think of, you know, a cow as an animal that provides us some meat, but, 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 you know, in all honesty, I mean, almost all that cow is, is utilized for something. I mean, we have oh, yeah. cow parts in, in cell phones. I mean, this is something that, you know, I recently found a lot of the TV screens and cell phone 
screens are made out of cholesterol from from animal parts and so we and then you know we find cows and tires we found them in all kinds of household products it's very interesting how much we are able to utilize the animal having said that we and we, we touched on that earlier something like 40 percent of the food we produce in the u.s does end up in in the trash can you know or or you know much of it at the you know a lot of its fruits and vegetables didn't make the grade because of the way they looked or you know they they rot in the grocery store or during transport or some of the baked goods so it's a you know i, I think it is a huge issue that, that we're losing a hard, significant percentage of our food production uh you know, oh, yeah. and, and when we're talking about how to make things sustainable how to save the environment that would be probably you know the biggest thing if we could we could figure out that so if you guys are able to utilize potential you know turn stuff into usable product rather than waste that's a great thing yeah we're certainly trying <laughs> yeah you know the, that was the question i was going to ask sean too about kind of the 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 bones after the fact and for folks who haven't made board crop before essentially like you know when you when you finish it it's no longer this like brittle uh hard like bone you can literally like if i had a handful of it i could just crunch it up and it would be powder basically just in the palm of my hand it gets that like uh, malleable more or less so it is interesting like that, that that can be used as fertilizer and bone meal and things like that and i do remember when i was when i was making it myself i, I looked into that at one point because i was thinking like well i'm at first i was just throwing that stuff away and i was wondering like well Sure. There's got to be another use for this somewhere. And I, I did read about people essentially grinding it up and kind of sprinkling it on top of like different dishes and things like that. So it's interesting when you just kind of keep, uh, keep plucking away at how much more you can use something, how much you can actually get out of it before it's completely gone. Oh yeah. Justin, what, what other, I mean, I, I think, cause you guys, are you guys doing something besides bone broth or do you have any other products or similar products that you guys are working on? Or yeah. So we, we launched uh, we have basically three core lines. So we have our, our core kind of bone broth line uh, that we've had since we started the company. Uh, we then launched a line of bone broth based soups. And so that, that is effectively like, if you look at the reason people think of, you know, chicken noodle soup is healthy. Uh, and the reason that that grandmothers prescribed it when you got sick, you know, 50 years ago, uh, is because that soup was made with bone broth. And, you know, we kind of look at a company like Campbell's that is that has not used bone broth and taken that nutrition source out of soups and packed it with sugars and a bunch of other additives um, and, and think that there's an opportunity to bring uh, the, the main source of nutrition back to the soup category. And so that was kind of our next product. And then we more recently launched a line of uh, keto friendly soups with bone broth as a base to help those who are transitioning onto a ketogenic diet, as well as a line of uh, drinkable bone broths and sippable bone broths that have things like turmeric, ginger, um, you know, chipotle beef bone broth, a, a lemongrass pho, which is among my favorites. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so we're, we're kind of expanding into multiple product lines uh, as we speak. We just launched those, those two lines in the last two months. Oh, that's interesting. What, uh, you know, what has been the most popular product for you guys, you know, as far as bone broth? Has there been one flavor versus the other? Or do you have a sort of a one most people like? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we found that generally our core, our top sellers, and maybe it's just because they've been around the longest, I'm not sure, uh, tend to be the just the core beef and chicken, like products that, uh, you know, products that everyone can use, understand, are pretty familiar. And so those are definitely our top sellers uh, as of right now. Yeah, I know the, the beef has been my favorite one. I'll, I mean, I'll drink it hot or cold. In fact, this time of year, I prefer it a little colder. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, what I find myself using it for, too, is I'll make up uh, or I'll grill or I'll slow cook a roast or something like that. And, you know, rather than sipping on water while I'm eating that, I'll be sipping on the on the broth. And it just kind of gives it that that kind of flavor or adds a little bit of extra flavor to it, which is kind of cool. I love that. That's awesome. Does anybody use it? You know, I was thinking about it because, you know, a lot of people use like bouillon and stuff like that as a, as a, or, you know, different ways to kick, cook, soak, you know, I mean, sort of marinate meats. Is anybody using bone broth as a oh, cooking yeah. aid for things? Like how would people do that? I mean, other yeah, than just sipping people, it. Yeah, a lot of people use it to, to braise, you know, if, if they're braising something or if they're marinating it. Um, it, it adds quite a lot of flavor and kind of richness to it um, and, and just can also be a good source of collagen and protein if you're looking to, 
you know, nutritionally upgrade a meal. So if you're like slow roasting a chuck roast or something like that, you could throw in oh, chicken yeah. bone broth or regular bone broth. And yeah, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I do with my slow cooker. Now I'll go and I'll get like a, a three pound chuck roast. I'll put that in the slow cooker and then I'll pour one of the boxes of the beef broth on top of it and just let that sit in there for like eight hours or however long. And um, I mean, it's, it's certainly easier than putting water in there and adding salt. That sounds amazing. You should uh, host the next podcast at your house, man. Yeah. <laughs> Car- carnivore meetup. I'll just get a few slow cookers going. Chuck roasts and kettle and fire. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't done that. That's a good idea because I've got some of the, 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 the bone broth in my in my house. But I, I just I, like I said, I, when it's ninety five degrees out, I'm not I'm not stoked about sup- sipping on hot bone broth. So <laughs> it may be the next time I make a chuck roast or something like that, I throw a couple bottles, or, you know, a couple boxes of that in there. That might be a good way to utilize that i think i would recommend and, it and one thing i should probably ask you about justin if you know because because i may be i may be doing something incorrectly here is when i do that like i'll put the a box of that in there and i'll put a chuck roast and i'll cook it and then you know i'll take the the glass part of the slow cooker out and i'll actually put that leftover broth in the fridge and mm-hmm. then i'll use it again for another roast is there like should i be worried about a specific shelf life of that once it's out of the box and in the fridge like that uh, not really. I mean, anywhere, anywhere like seven to 14 days is, is probably very safe. Okay. Especially testing it again. It's, it's like generally not a, not a huge issue. Mm-hmm. Well, cause one, one of the reasons why I like to do it that way too, is because once the roast is in there and cooked, there's a layer of fat that gets separated from the roast. And then when I stick that glass bowl into the fridge, that layer kind of, it almost forms like what looks like a sheet of ice, which is basically just uh, beef tallow. And then I'll, I'll take that off the top and I'll use that to cook eggs and things in uh, throughout the course of the week too. So it's yeah. uh, it's kind of a good way to render that, that unused fat that got separated during the slow cooking process. Totally agree. I, I do the same thing and it's awesome. Hey, back when you guys, cause obviously you guys are up and running on all cylinders now and expanding and, th- and life is, I, I would assume crazy and hectic and busy, but, but you probably have good problems rather than, you know, but was it always like that for you guys? What was it like when you guys started up? Was there times when you thought, man, this isn't going to work or, or did you have to face a lot of adversity or how did you guys get, you know, how oh, did you guys get, how did you guys get funded to get going and all that stuff? I mean, what was, yeah. what was the early days like at Kettle and Fire? For sure. So, uh, so we, we self-funded ourselves for the first year. Like I, I believed in this business. I wanted, I put uh, most of my savings as a then 25 year old into the business um, you know, my parents weren't super thrilled with that decision, but, uh, I think now they're okay with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we basically got into this business, my brother and I, we'd never done anything in physical products. We'd never done anything in food. We have no background in, in starting a CPG, um, you know, our consumer products brand business. And so there was a pretty steep learning curve. I mean, we had to figure out how to find ranchers to source bones from, how to validate that they were telling us the truth about the quality of their product, um, how to ship it into our, our manufacturing partner who then makes the bone broth, had developed the recipe. Like there were probably the first 10 months of the business before we'd actually launched a product. We were about 50-50 on whether or not we'd be able to get this thing off the ground. Like there were just so many headaches in the food world in terms of figuring out like, how you go from idea to actually product in a box that you can sell online or in stores. And, and we just weren't sure that we would be able to figure it out there. uh, You know, to find our, our manufacturing partner, we had to call and email over 300 different manufacturers to see if they could make our product. Uh, That just takes forever. And so finding a partner, um, working through the recipe, figuring out the sourcing, like all of that took, you know, almost 10 months before, uh, before we had our first iteration that, that we were actually happy with. And so it was a lot of upfront work. Uh, a lot of times where I was like, man, I don't, I don't know if this thing is ever going to get off the ground. Uh, but after that, you know, we, we launched a month or two, we were blown away by the response. Uh, and, you know, have since then just kind of been handling the problems that come with growth. Like how do you stay in stock? How do you make sure that your supply chain is good? How do you hire and build a good team? Uh, how do you get the word out about bone broth? all of that, but it's been a really exciting journey. What do you guys, I mean, you, cause you mentioned, you know, verifying the sourcing was accurate. Were you, were you seeing a lot of people that were advertising one thing and it wasn't, you know, where you guys are saying, yeah, I've got grass fed cantaloupe and yeah. in reality it wasn't. Well, how, how, 
how prevalent was that issue that you ran into? Uh, very prevalent, actually. The, the first bone source that we were going to work with uh, said that he had grass-fed bones, um, you know, 100% grass-fed, organic, all that. Um, we sent him $40,000 and never heard from him again. He, like, just ran off. <laughs> so, uh, like, that kind of stuff happens. Food manufacturing in the food world is a very old-school business. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so it's not a little bit, a little disconcerting. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. but but I mean, they so he just never, he just took your money and ran and never gave you exactly. anything. Totally but I mean, but, that's, but are there people that are? I wonder. I wonder that that's. I assume there's some kind of recourse you could have for that. I don't know, but uh, yeah, you know, I mean, were you? But were you running into people saying, "Hey, I've got grass-fed beef," and then you go out to verify it, and it's, it's not? Was that something you guys saw quite a bit? Or yeah, we we were seeing a a, a decent a bit of that. I mean, we saw people that said. You know, hey, I, I have grass fed, grass finished, and then you and then you dig a little deeper, and it turns out, um, you know, they were they were using like really crappy sources of grass, or they were using grass pellets where they were then they had the same kind of factory farming setup, and cattle weren't free to graze, but instead of eating corn or soy, they were just eating grass pellets out of the same kind of like feedlot troughs, um, and so you, you got some of that for sure that we had to diligence and find our way through. Just kind of wondering what the incentive to be using grass pellets would be. I mean, it doesn't seem like you know you're not getting. I mean, just let them graze on the grass. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's slightly cheaper. I think is the problem, you know. And with yeah. these farmers, like we could go way deep on the food system another time, but uh, farmers are in a tough economic, st you know, mm -hmm. standing, like standing where they don't have often a lot of options. Like I feel bad for for a lot of these guys that uh, you know have to resort to things like that to try and even make their business break even it's just a, it's a shitty system that we have right now yeah I, there's no, go ahead zach i was just gonna say i wonder if some of that too is a product of the environment in which they're raising the cattle so you get up into some of these more kind of northern states where you know they're going to have a harsh winter but they want to feed their cattle a grass-based diet versus a corn or soy based one they would maybe do that during the winter months and then graze during the summer i'm sure it's very much like case by case. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that would maybe be where, where the efficacy of a grass pellet would be versus letting them just wander around and graze year round. Definitely. Yeah. What do you guys, you know, I mean, you said your brother is part of, was part of it. How many employees are you guys up to now? Uh, we're up to 30 now. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So it's definitely it's going big, going big. And are you located in the Midwest too, or is it, or is it, or is it just the processing plants are there? We're just the processing plant. I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay. Well, yeah, Austin's a nice. Yeah. I was over there three times this year, so it's a nice place. Nice. So, yeah, it's great. I love it. Were you a, were you Texas were you a Texas guy growing up, or where, where were you from? No, I moved here about a year ago, um, year and a half ago. So I grew up in like the D.C. area, and then moved out to San Francisco to work in tech, and then wanted. To get out of the Bay Area and somewhere that uh, was a bit more affordable. <laughs> and so that's, you know, brought me to Austin, Texas. Yeah, Austin has kind of become almost a little bit of a tech area itself. I mean, a bunch of tech companies moved out to Austin years ago. Oh, for sure. I was there. When I was in college there, they were starting to do that. And that was 30 years ago. So interesting how that's been. But uh, anyway, well, Zach, anything else we wanted? You wanted just is anything else we need to know that you can you can take the week that you'd like to share or? No, I, I super appreciate you guys having me on. I, I really enjoyed this chat and uh, yeah, happy to answer any further questions. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I think we did a pretty cool dive into the kind of the bone broth and dug into some of the, the topics involved around it. So um, we're very grateful for your time and willingness to come on and share some of that stuff with us. Uh, if, our, if our listeners want to find out more about you or Kettle and Fire, are there any social media links or anything you'd like to share for them to head over to? Yeah, uh, check us out at kettleandfire.com. Uh, or, you know, we're on social media with all of the Cattle and Fire handles. Um, I'm pretty sure we're the only brand with that handle, so you should be able to find us. <laughs> yeah, if you've, if you've got, Justin, if you guys have any of those, those papers that, like, support, you know, some of the benefits of bone broth and some of the components and gelatins and collagen and stuff like that, that you know, if you, if you send them to Zach, we can put them in the, uh, we can link them in the show notes, I think, right, Perfect. Zach? We can, we can do yep. that. Yeah, that would, that would be awesome. So, I mean, for people who want to get more research because you know it's kind of boring to read through a paper on a podcast it just doesn't 
it doesn't keep people too excited. So that would yes. be a good research <laughs> for folks. I will yeah. send that over. Cool. And I will mention to the listeners who are interested in clicking through those, if you listen to the podcast on iTunes, iTunes does limit the number of characters we're able to put in the show notes. So I'm not always able to put everything on the iTunes show notes. So if you want to see that, feel free to listen to it on iTunes the way you normally would, but just either go over to the YouTube page or a different one of the different sites that host the podcast too to get those links for easy click through. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think we're, we're good to go. I know uh, I did get an email from Holly this morning saying she was going to give us a 15% off uh, promo code for listeners of the HPO podcast. So if you're looking to get your hands on some kettle and fire bone broth to try out, that will also be in the show notes as well. Awesome. Thanks so much guys. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Thanks Thanks, Justin. Appreciate it. Take care. Hey folks, human performance outliers podcast is growing and due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.